welcome back. If this is your first in conversation with Ignite session, welcome. We hope that you find this fun, engaging, and a behind the scenes a sneak peek into what it is like to do science. And so with, just, with that, we'll start the session in a minute or so. And uh, just one thing I'd like to say, I hope all of you engage actively in today's session. Please do submit your questions to the Q&A box so you can also participate in this, in this conversation. Uh, we have kept a substantial portion of today's uh, event for questions that have come in from the audience. For those of you who have submitted your questions through the registration form, we have collected them, we have compiled them. Thank you for the many, many questions uh, that you have shared uh, while registering for this event. So I think, um, Suchi, with this, we can maybe stop the video and I'll hand it over to Jyotsna. So I'll give a quick introduction to Jyotsna, even though you would have seen it flashing on your screens. Uh, so Jyotsna Dhawan, thank you for joining us as an interlocutor in this session. She's a board member for the Ignite Life Science Foundation, the CEO for DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance, um, a, a scientist, a cell biologist, a developmental biologist, and very importantly, a mentor and a collaborator to many in this community. Uh, so Jyotsna, over to you. Thank you so much, Shantala, and thank you uh, to everybody who's been helping with organizing this uh, conversation session for uh, Ignite Life Science Foundation. Uh, it's a huge privilege for me to host this conversation with Professor Ron Vale, who is uh, Executive Director of the Janelia Research Campus and Vice President of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So Ron, as you know, is widely known for his pioneering work in basic cell biology, specifically on the involvement of uh, motor proteins in the movement of uh, organelles and proteins inside cells. So, you know, his work has made uh, really uh, fundamental discoveries and is now part of the textbooks. Um, Ron and his colleagues made a whole series of discoveries that showed how the cytoskeleton is not a static structure, but highly dynamic, and that these proteins called motors use the cytoskeleton uh, as tracks um, for moving vesicles and other organelles uh, in highly regulated ways. Uh, many in the audience will also know that while Ron was at UCSF, along with his colleagues, Jim Spudich at Stanford University and Mike Sheets, uh, then at Washington University, I believe, developed a series of very elegant methods for visualizing and measuring uh, these subcellular movements in very precise and quantitative ways. Uh, the implications of this basic work for understanding normal cellular function are very profound. And they've had a, a major impact on wide ranging questions from development to disease. So as you also know, Ron is equally well known for his deep engagement with the scientific community and the public. He's immersed himself in developing effective ways of teaching and mentoring, encouraging a diverse group of scientists across the world in enlarging their own careers and in giving back to the community fostering ways in which young people can themselves be mediators of transformation and not just passive participants in uh, their own progress and that of their academic environments. So Ron, welcome. Uh, you. Sorry for that slightly extended uh, introduction. <laughs> you're, you're very well known in the- it was wonderful to listen to it. Uh, Jyotsna, and it's a great opportunity to uh, connect with you and talk to you today. Uh, we've known each other for a long time, so I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, it's early in the morning for you, not so late in the evening for us. Uh, so I'm going to start with a few biographical questions, Ron, because you know you grew up in glamorous Hollywood in a family that was immersed in the creative and performing arts film, writing, acting. How did you find yourself drawn to science? What were your early influences? Well, uh, I did come out 
I grew up in an unusual environment, as you mentioned, which is Hollywood. I went to Hollywood High School. Uh, a lot of my classmates did go into uh, the entertainment business in one way or another. Um, and as you mentioned, my uh, uh, well, my parents are from uh, you know more arts background. My father was a writer. My mother was an actress uh, in her early life. Um, but I would say that. You know, my parents just in, were deeply interested in all subjects. I mean, they they were obviously fascinated by the arts, but philosophy and uh, the sciences as well. But I, I think the most influential um, element of my upbringing was that my mother took me to museums uh, in Los Angeles, uh, took me to... Uh, uh, the Natural History Museum, where, you know, where, I mean, I'm talking about when I was like five, six, seven years old. And I was just struck by the wonder of everything, you know, seeing like dinosaurs and uh, learning about stars and planets and so forth. And, uh, um, and I, I, I just loved wandering around museums. And I, I think that was something that curiosity that inspired me at museums was very much uh, drove my interest in science. And maybe we can get back to this later, but I think, you know, a, a key trait of being a, a scientist is just to be curious. And, uh, you know, if you can maintain your curiosity, not just when you're, you know, early in your childhood, but maintain that in your adult life, I think that's just a wonderful gift, I think, for being a human being and, uh, and certainly a, a key trait for uh, being successful in science too. Yes, I think it's a remarkable thing that museums, uh, a remarkable role that museums play in sparking interest in the world around us and uh, encouraging people to sort of think about how things happen and not just observe that things are there. Uh, so what did your friends and family think about your decision to go into science? Were you considered nerdy or teased for this or were you encouraged to explore your own path? Well, my, my, you know, my parents uh, just encouraged me to do whatever I was interested in. For, fortunately, I didn't have, uh, you know, my parents didn't really want to drive me into one direction or another, but uh, really just fostered whatever I was interested in. Um, and as I did mention, you know, my parents, uh, you know, did have very, uh, broad interests. Also, I could just mention one thing about my parents, you know, neither one of them uh, went to college. Uh, there were many disruptions in their life during World War II, so that opportunity just wasn't available, and they actually had to leave Europe and come to the United States. Um, but they were incredibly self-educated. Um, you know, they, they read all the great books, just were interested in many things. Um, so, you know, I, I think their, their broad interest um, and interest in self-education, I, I think, inspired, uh, or at least uh, certainly I absorbed that. Um, you know, now for my friends, well, uh, you know, that's interesting. Um, I mean, in elementary school, you know, kids have all kinds of different interests. And in fact, I would say, you know, those interests are almost fun and you know, kids share those interests pretty freely. Um, uh, you know, I, I think what was interesting is when I went through middle school and then high school, um, you know, I went to schools where being interested in academics was not necessarily, um, uh, you know, what most of my peers were, were interested in. And, um, you know, so it, it was actually an interesting environment where um, uh, you didn't want to look too academic or too nerdy in, in that environment. Um, and uh, a lot of my high school classmates uh, never went to college even. Um, so, so that was a very different environment. And there weren't a lot of kids that were interested in in, in science in my high school. And it wasn't a passion that, you know, I honestly felt like I could share with uh, a lot of my peer group. 
Um, I, I did though, uh, kind of win a science competition. I did a high school science project. Um, and part of winning that competition, I, I, um, I got a trip to Washington, DC. I travel a lot now, but at that time, you know, actually in many ways, my parents didn't have that much money. So we didn't travel a lot. That was the first time I ever left the state of California actually. And um, so it, it was, I was at high school at the time. It was, you know, amazing for me just to go to another state, but I also met all these kids uh, for the first time who were kind of shared this similar interest in, in science. And it, it was kind of interesting for me because I realized, wow, there is this world of other people that are interested in the same things that I am. And that it's like a fun and interesting group of people. And I think also that's something that, that has stuck with me again, throughout my scientific career is that, uh, you know, I, I think scientists do have this kind of common passion, common language, of course, in India or US, we can speak the same language of science indeed with scientists in any country around the world. And it is an amazing community of people uh, and a fun community of people to be in. And I think I learned that first in high school, but I, you know, it's, it's something that I, 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 I kept realizing as I kept on with my career in science as well. Yes, I think uh, uh, the first encounter with a group of people who share one's interest and one realizes that uh, not only uh, is one valued by the group, but that there's more to learn and that it's fun being around them. That's, that's a very affirming process. So, you know, moving on to your college career and then you decided to uh, enroll for an MD PhD, but um, what made you take that decision and uh, why did you not decide or why did you decide not to complete the MD part of it and focus on the PhD? Yes, well, maybe I'll tell you a little bit of that path and also reflect on something that may be relevant for many young scientists. Um, you know, I, I, I think also when I was young, uh, I really enjoyed science. I wasn't really certain if I could succeed in science, you know, uh, didn't know what it, it took. I came from, I did very well in high school, but I came from a very non-academic kind of high school where frankly, it was kind of easy to do relatively well. So, um, you know, and I think this is relevant because I, I, I you know, this term imposter syndrome, I think of many scientists uh, young and old feel that. Um, but, you know, to some extent, when I went to college, I was, you know, wondering, well, you know, am I going to do okay in college? And um, I, I should just stress that my love of the subject matter of science really kind of was kind of a guide star that, you know, that kept me going. But uh, I did well then in, in college, I got more research experience. Uh, I, I really tried to work in various labs, found that I enjoyed that tremendously. So at that point I was very convinced, you know, I wanted to have a research career. The very end I decided to apply for an MD PhD program. Um, you know, I, I would say almost largely, not necessarily that I want to become a doctor, but hearkening back again to my parents and thinking about broad scholarship and, and learning, I thought, well, actually, there's probably a lot you can learn by getting this MD that uh, as an experience that I wouldn't get necessarily just by working in a lab. So I, I kind of viewed it as a growth experience and adding kind of additional dimensionality to um, my interests and what I would learn. So that was a little bit my last minute decision to apply for MDP programs, um, you know, which were competitive to get into. But, you know, fortunately, at the end of the day, I got into uh, the, the, the Stanford uh, MD program. And uh, yeah, so that, that takes us to our probably our next question. Yes, well, you know, I think uh, graduate students are often quite curious about 
what propels a person to choose a particular topic for research because it just seems like a, a universe of possibilities ahead of you when you come into a program and tell us a little bit about what drew you to neuronal biology and what was the state of the science at the time that you entered the field yeah and i can also say you know for graduate students in, you know, in some ways there, I mean, people often think about what is the perfect choice and kind of anticipate what the field is going to be, et cetera. You know, I think also the lesson that I, I, I've learned, and I think a good way to approach biology is that if you're really interested in science, you can enter a lot of different fields uh, and, and A, you know, be successful at it and, uh, and, and find a passion for it. Um, and indeed, I've changed subjects of interest many times in my career. Maybe we'll come back to that. But uh, you know, uh, to your point, I think what um, you do have to pick something, right? And uh, I did some work as an undergraduate on hormone receptors, like epidermal growth factor receptor, insulin receptor. I actually worked for. Um, uh, an internship um, with Robert Lefkowitz in my senior year of high school. He, he is a Nobel Prize winner. And the time I was there was the key work that the lab was doing that led to his Nobel Prize. So it was a very exciting environment where, you know, they were isolating the beta adrenergic receptor for the first time. So it was, it was just a, a cool scientific environment. Uh, in, in which I felt I found myself surrounded. So I think that influenced my choice of also wanting to work on hormone receptors when I went to Stanford. Um, and then I began to look at various labs, talking to people. And um, I discovered um, Eric Shooter, who was working on a hormone and a receptor, which was nerve growth factor. Now, of course, there's nerve mentioned in there, and he was the chair of the Department of Neurobiology. So that also kind of got me into this new field of neurobiology and, you know, an additional learning experience. But the entry point was, I think, hormone receptors. But the other key thing, and this is a really important lesson uh, for, I think, young scientists choosing a lab, it should, yes, the topic must be of interest to you. That is essential um, and also realize that you probably, you know, will change topics during your career. But the other key thing is finding a fantastic lab environment and mentor. And I cannot stress that enough. That is probably more important than the topic that you choose. Um, and I was very fortunate to have just an amazing mentor, Eric Shooter, um, and, um, actually his wife, Elaine, who was kind of a lab manager, they just created a wonderful family environment in the lab that benefited myself, but everyone else there and created a wonderful environment in which to work. Um, and I can also, maybe later I'll get to other, some other points of why, why Eric was such an amazing mentor, but, um, Absolutely. maybe I'll let you lead with the next question. <laughs> Sure. Uh, you know, thinking about your graduate work um, that took place in the early 80s, and there was this huge pace and excitement about discoveries in molecular biology and gene regulation, and they had pretty much infected a very large proportion of the biology community. So uh, what was known about the cytoskeleton at the time, and was the field considered a forefront area or a bit of a backwater? And you know, did did this view of the field influence your interest, or was your interest really quite independent of the prevailing winds? Yes. Well, let me just start off with the first point that you mentioned that when I was at Stanford at the time, it was the hub and center of molecular biology at the time. I mean, yes. it's very hard to relate now. I think for most young scientists and graduate students, but you know, this was the time when cloning a gene would be an entire thesis, uh, one gene. And it wasn't, uh, you know, it followed really on 
just a few years after when I joined Stanford on when molecular biology was even possible. Uh, for example, being able you know, to use restriction enzymes to cut pieces of DNA, Paul Berg's work, being able to take fragments of DNA and put it into vectors that could then propagate or be expressed in cells. It was the time in which the first biotech companies ever were started, uh, which came out of Stanford and UCSF, you know, uh, Stan Cohen's work and her Boyer, you know, that Bill Rutter, this was the foundation, you know, Genentech just started, Chiron just started. Anyway, it was an amazing time molecular biology. So one of the things I did not do was go into molecular biology, I yes. should say. That would have been the cool thing to do, uh, the trendy thing to do. But, you know, I decided that, you know, I was actually quite interested in this other topic, which was more biochemistry and hormone receptors. Fortunately, there were a lot of amazing people in that field too. Arthur Kornberg, you know, quintessential biochemist, won the Nobel Prize for purifying DNA polymerase. People like Jim Rothman, who was an assistant professor, reconstituting things that led to a Nobel Prize. That work was going on right when I was joined as a graduate student. Jim Spudich, very influential uh, mentor and scientist who did a lot of biochemistry and reconstitution. So, um, you know, I, you know, didn't follow that exact path. Now, you know, the cytoskeleton, it wasn't as cool as molecular biology. It also wasn't a backwater, um, you know, in the sense that actually the cytoskeleton has been studied for a century. I mean, it is one of the, the discovery of muscle, muscle contraction. I still call that the cytoskeleton and uh, you know, the discovery of actin and myosin, this was like foundational stuff in, you know, modern physiology and biochemistry. Of course, the cytoskeleton inside of cells, partially known, I mean, they knew there was actin there, tubulin there. What was a bit of a backwater was the field I went into, which was axonal transport. Um, that was known to be a phenomena since the 1940s. Um, it was highly thought that, you know, probably microtubules and actin somehow, you know, might be involved, but beyond that, not much was known about it. So that was the field that, you know, I did decide to pursue. And that is also an important lesson that constantly in your career is to find things where you're not just one of many people just working on the same problem, but to try to find something that is, I wouldn't say backwater, it sounds like um, a non-flattering term, but a little bit understudied, yes. a little bit understudied so you can find a niche and uh, make a contribution. And I, I think that's an important thing to do. Yes, identifying open questions are, or not necessarily even questions, but just areas where uh, there isn't that much focus or people just uh, either the tools aren't available or the, the field hasn't been defined well. Um, so tell, tell us a little bit about your first encounter with uh, Jim Spudich and Mike Sheets and how that collaboration developed over the years. Well, that was when I was a graduate student um, in Eric Shooter's lab. Uh, uh, my, my work with hormone receptors actually did involve some work on the cytoskeleton. And uh, I was frequently coming down to uh, Jim's lab just to talk about that or learn more about it. Uh, so it intersected with my, actually my first studies, even on nerve growth factor. Um, Mike Sheets then was a sabbatical um, uh professor in Spudich lab, and they were trying to reconstitute myosin motility, meaning like out of a muscle and in a more test tube environment. And they did that by putting um, myosin on plastic beads and showed that it could, the myosin could make these plastic beads walk along actin cables in a cell-free environment. So that was actually a big breakthrough 
in um, developing a simpler system than studying whole muscle. Um, and that is what the concept of reconstitution is to try to take a very complex system and break it down into components, ideally in a simplified environment. So that was an exciting experiment. And also at the time, I was thinking a lot about transport in axons because I knew that nerve growth factor and the receptor had to travel from the nerve terminal to the cell body somehow to transmit information. Um, and the mechanism of how things move between these very long distances in, act, in nerve cells, which could be up to a meter in size in a human, for example, in, in a motor neuron in your leg, is unknown. And I saw those movies that Sheets and Spudich did and they go, wow, this kind of looks like a transport mechanism that could apply to neurons. And, um, and you know, they were interested in that too, as an idea. So then I began talking to Mike more about actually trying to test that out and, and test whether uh, one could develop an, you know, a, a, some kind of system to test this hypothesis. The original hypothesis was that myosin carries vesicles and materials inside of nerve axons, which uh, you know, we might come back to later, but was the incorrect hypothesis. But you know, that's how it got started. So uh, let, let me shift now to kinesin, uh, for which you are so well known, the, the hand over hand movement of the kinesin molecule is such a beautiful example of the interdisciplinary approach between structural biology, biochemistry, single molecular assays, and sort of cell biological tests. So tell us something about the experimental design and the approach that led you and your colleagues to uncovering this mechanism. You know, what were the key insights? Well, you know, that, yeah, that kind of was a path of maybe, um, let's see, maybe 13 years. But um, uh, I'll preface that by saying that, you know, the, the time at Woods Hole was actually getting from this point of actually wrong hypothesis. So let's just start there. That, that original hypothesis of myosin uh, being the transport, long distance transport motor uh, was incorrect. And there were then some experiments that, um, that showed that that was not the right track. So that's very common in science, you know, that you start off somewhere and you end up something else. Oftentimes where you end up is much better, you know, because in this case, um, you know, it's always, and this is another important thing to say, it's always nearly impossible to imagine something that you don't know. And that's what science is about. And of course, didn't know about kinesin, right? So um, uh, it wasn't even clear that there was something to look for. But the path of the wrong hypothesis eventually led to discovering kinesin. So that's, you know, a whole little epic. But then um, after kinesin, I would say, you know, that was done quite a bit using microscopes. And you can see these little things moving under the microscope. And um, it was fascinating. So again, back to curiosity, you know, the curiosity moment was like, wow, how does this work? You know, how is this little machine that we didn't know how big it was, but it, very small. I mean, we knew it was a, like 120 kilodalton protein. So, you know, small, um, you know, must be producing this movement, but you know, how? And honestly, when I was a graduate student, that question seemed unanswerable. It seemed like maybe I would discover this when I'm my age you know, now. I mean, it was really <laughs> unclear if this would be understandable or when. And I, I think this is also a reflection of what science is today. It, it, there's so many new techniques that you can't imagine that pop up and advances that, you know, end up 
allowing experiments that were once impossible to be possible. So that was the 14 year, 13, 14 year journey to discovering the mechanism that you described. So and I interrupt and say, you know, at the time, it didn't even feel like that since you couldn't even imagine what the mechanism was, it meant that you had to develop tools and methods to be able to ask questions that were simply unanswerable with the available tools and methods. And so that took a certain amount of courage to invest that kind of time into uh, and thinking into a very unknown process. Yeah, I mean, courage is good, but, you know, I would also say that, that, you know, courage is the nature of science, right? I mean, science is about being adventurous. And, you know, uh, it's, I can use the analogy of like explorers at one time who had lousy maps of the world and had to like set off and like define unknown land masses. Um, you know, that's kind of what science is. You're right at this edge of between the known and the unknown. And that's kind of right at the edge that you want to be. And um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, I, I think courage is part of it, but I think that's kind of the fun and the expectation of being a scientist, but And the courage is driven again by the curiosity. Like, do I really want to know the answer? And am I patient? Because, you know, it wasn't like that question, how does this little motor produce movement? It's not like solvable in two years. So it did require some persistence, patience, bootstrapping. Of course, other, the field advances, other labs make contributions, you feed off of that. But I would say the biggest breakthroughs were, probably single molecule assays, um, which now are very common. Um, In many ways, those assays emerged out of kinesin uh, and in the investigation of kinesin. And then very quickly after about the same time happened for myosin. But previously, the only single molecule assay that was around was for ion channels, which was a couple, you know, more than 10 years before. And that was patch clamping, which led to a Nobel prize, but other, otherwise single molecule assays were not a thing in those days, but uh, the motor protein field and pursuing the problem, you know, that emerged. And, um, um, and then the other thing was uh, structural biology as a field advanced enormously. That was critical for kinesin. Um, And uh, then maybe the third thing was a bit of a surprise, but was, but was very influential for solving the mechanism was a completely unknown, unexpected discovery that kinesin and myosin, which no one thought were related to one another before one works on actin, one works on microtubules fields had separate meetings turned out to be relatives and evolved from a common ancestor. And in fact, to some extent that evolutionary perspective did allow one to bootstrap between both of these proteins and try to discover common rules, which again, were very influential for understanding the mechanism. So I could think of more, but in my view, those were three key things that were very helpful from coming, solving a problem that seemed unknowable to a reasonably satisfying answer. Yes, I think the evolutionary perspective must have made a big difference because it suddenly opens up connectivities which one had not anticipated. And that's that's remarkable. So I'm gonna sort of shift a little bit and say, ask you a little bit about how you approach organizing a new program for your lab. Uh, is it always driven by current work? and the key open questions in the field that you've had a curiosity about, or have, have there been times when you've decided to take a lateral shift and um, work in an entirely new area? And how much have students and postdocs in your lab contributed to that change in direction? Um, well, I'll, I'll answer the latter part. Uh, students and postdocs, I would say, uh, are critical actually for, um, 
you know, laboratories to get new energy in terms of ideas, directions, and so forth. I, I also feel like it's central to, you know, even the environment of the lab and, 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 and kind of the mentorship and guidance of the PI to foster entrepreneurship in the lab um, and not to create like a, 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 a narrow, you know, kind of alleyway for the people you bring into the lab to travel. Um, and, you know, I think one of the exciting things, at least for me about being a PI is, is to create that environment of idea generation, entrepreneurship, um, which, you know, allows new experiments or new projects to be pursued in the lab. Also very good because the postdocs need to take projects with them uh, to leave your lab to start their own careers. Um, so I think students and postdocs are critical and I think creating the right environment, like I said, of entrepreneurship is important for a successful lab. Also sometimes, you know, also guidance from the lab, uh, director, you know, head too is, is important. You know, for example, you know, we could have kept working on Kinesin forever and ever. I mean, there's always questions to ask on any field but sometimes it is really healthy, I think, to say, well, you know, we had a good run of it here. Maybe we should try something new. I'm, you know, and uh, although we're focusing and we did decide to make a strategic shift as a lab from Kinesin to dining at one point in time. And I think that was, you know, a good and smart thing to do. And the reason was that we knew a lot about Kinesin. We knew very little about dining. And um, that seemed like an exciting new journey. Um, but honestly, if you look at what our lab has done over time, it's been incredibly diverse. I mean, yes. we've worked on many different kinds of micro, you know, cytoskeletal binding proteins, uh, discovered many other proteins involved in cytoskeleton, worked on mitosis, you know, we've uh, worked on cell motility, we've worked on RNA biology, uh, we've worked on T cell signaling, um, uh, worked on macrophages more recently. I mean, and more. So um, you know, yes. I mean, so that's been also at, at least I've kind of enjoyed that breadth of subject matter in the lab. So exploring the dimensions into which your key questions take you uh, is uh, a very sort of fun and rewarding thing to do. Um, so I, I want to shift a little bit to your uh, uh, sort of interest in mentoring and community service and uh, specifically talk about the time that you spent uh, as, uh, on sabbatical in India. Um, and uh, during that time, you met quite widely with scientists, specifically young scientists, and helped start multiple new initiatives. So tell us something about that experience and you know, what made you engage with uh, people so deeply halfway across the world from your scientific home? Yes, well, I could um, say, first of all, talking about adventures. <laughs> adventures are always good. I mean, that's part of life and science. Like just deciding to come to India was a bit of an adventure. I mean, we, um, you know, I had a sabbatical coming up. I knew very little about India, quite frankly, uh, you know, just made previously a three day trip to NCBS and uh, knew almost nothing about India, frankly, or Indian biology. But I, I thought, you know, it would just be an interesting place to be, even though I didn't know a lot about it. And NCBS seemed like to be you know, just a, a really great campus and environment. So, you know, it, it took a chance on a, like going there for nine months, not knowing exactly what the outcome would be. Uh, but also understanding that India was at this really interesting point in time in its sciences where it, it you know, economically, it was going into this growth phase. This growth phase was, you know, being, um, increasingly directed towards science funding. And it seemed to be a really important pivotal inflection point in 
uh, kind of the growth and the rapid growth of um, a scientific enterprise in a country. So I just figured it would be interesting to learn something. I, I went there, I had the great pleasure of just, you know, I, I did want to meet with people and talk to many young scientists there. And I mean, in short, I just found the environment, the time, the people, People, you know, are wonderful. I've, you know, now made many uh, friends in India. I love going back to India. Um, but, you know, it also struck me that uh, in this very important time, it's not all about building new institutes and buildings and buying equipment. It's, it's really about, about uh, you know, building the entire scientific ecosystem, uh, which really you know, has to start with, you know, culture, mentorship, and, you know, promoting careers of young scientists, because the future of India, Indian science, you know, rests so much on all, you know, the young scientists who are coming through the training system, and eventually are going to be running labs or in biotech or, you know, going to be leaders. So, um, you know, that is part of how I, uh, you know, I was just inspired in, in some way to both see if I could help and participate uh, in, in this great adventure of India at the time. Um, but that did lead to, you know, again, many unexpected things. Uh, you know, we started, you know, from a dinner with three other um, junior faculty members members, the idea of the young investigator meeting came up really out of a dinner conversation. You know, um, that's now been, I, you know, the pandemic has happened, so it's hard to keep track of numbers, but maybe it's in its 13th year. Someone can correct me, yes. but that's amazing to see that meeting going on so much at the, and at the first meeting, a conversation with postdocs over beer Kind of gave rise to the idea of India bioscience, and you can see that there's now an organ, a great organization, um, and staff doing all kinds of exciting programs in India. Uh, very important also for communication, empowerment of young scientists, development of Indian culture. Anyway, um, you know, again, like all these things can start off at very small and opportunistic ways. And that's true of science. And it's also true of even organizations. So anyway, we can keep talking about that, but it's, it, it's been a really fun journey just to uh, engage with, um, you know, Indian scientists over the past, you know, well, 12, more than 12 years in, yeah. uh, in these activities. Yes. So, you know, you've met so many uh, Indian scientists, both uh, during your visits in India, but also uh, in the US. And uh, many postdocs returning to India after working in the US and Europe do so out of a commitment uh, to working in India, but are dogged with the feeling that perhaps they're not going to be able to address questions with the sophistication that their time abroad allowed them to do. So what advice would you give to young scientists returning to careers in India? Are there opportunities here that they would not find elsewhere? Yeah, I do think there, I do think there are opportunities. And I, I think also in a way, India does allow for, you know, even sometimes opportunities to explore things that are harder to explore in the US. But resource wise, you know, it is more challenging. And I, I think one of the transitional things is coming from a lab of an HHMI investigator with all the equipment in the world and, and uh, big university with many colleagues, um, you know, to in a, many times a smaller environment uh, um, at an Indian institution where there may be even fewer colleagues in your uh, you know, immediate field and, you know, less equipment. Um, I think where there's an opportunity is 
to really think deeply about your problem and not necessarily play the same game that's going on in many of European and US labs. And uh, even if a lot of postdocs reflect on their experience, they can see that their labs are actually, you know, they're right at the leading edge, but they're in highly competitive fields. Yes. Banging away against a lot of other US and European labs. And, you know, to some extent, that's almost expected in some ways. I hate to say that for US funding or, um, you know, career advancement. I, but I do feel that being in India, it's a more permissive environment to choose like your own path that is slightly different. And I think, meaning pursue problems that are, are really less studied. And um, reflecting back in the beginning of the conversation, well, that's what I did in, in graduate school. And it turned out to be pretty, pretty successful. There were more labs working on hormone receptor interactions. <laughs> yes. Including my friend, you know, Robert Lefkowitz, who had a lab of 20 people. And, you know, there were commonalities still, people study different hormone receptors, but there were a lot of labs studying that problem. And it was a really good move to move into axonal transport, which was a much, much smaller field. So um, I, I think making that part of the equation in a thoughtful way about coming back and starting your lab in, in India, I think is, perhaps important strategically, but also potentially really empowering, um, you know, to be able to pursue questions actually that you want to pursue and, and not, not just chasing what everyone else is doing in the field. Um, um, and I mean, the one other thing I can say is that, you know, part of the, also the uh, whole purpose of the young investigator meeting uh, is was about like creating communities of young scientists. And I, 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 India Bioscience is still doing uh, fantastic work on that. But I think that is a very important thing for you know, early career scientists to do in India to really feel like to some extent they are, well, the future of India, I think uh, also seeing themselves as leaders seeing themselves as, as creating community, uh, sometimes, you know, and frequently between institutes is, um, is also very, you know, very important. Um, I, I think message that we also try to convey at these meetings and through India Bioscience as well. Yes, because too often, I think uh, all of us can get so caught up in our careers and in, uh, dealing with the sort of nitty gritty of the everyday as well as planning for the future that we forget that we're part of a, an environment that can make a big difference to new people coming in or even our colleagues whom we uh, haven't spent sufficient uh, time uh, thinking about. Uh, so I think I'm going to uh, start wrapping up, but I want to ask you uh, a question about, you know, the fact that you've had this incredible journey of discovery and achievement and fulfillment, and you've spread your success by giving generously of yourself and your insights to the scientific community. Now, looking back, uh, is there anything that you think you may have done differently or could you identify a point or points where you were undecided or had multiple options and what spurred your decision to take a particular path? Well, you know, I think the big message in life is that whatever you do is the right thing to do. And I think you have to adopt that in your life. And honestly, if I rolled the dice and like some decisions were made, you know, differently, I, I, didn't, get, I didn't get into Stanford. I went to somewhere else. I chose another problem than I did. Um, I decided to go to MD or not. I mean... I kind of look back and just say it would have all been fine, honestly. And uh, I, I, I think this, you know, that's the kind of approach. I mean, you know, we all could have multiple wonderful lives and we do have a chance to create multiple lives for ourselves in our 
in personal lives and our in our career. And I think you just have to embrace the path chosen. Um, the other point just to say about, um, you know, different times in your life, I, I do want to stress, I, I have invested a lot of time, not just in the science, but also thinking about how to give back to the community. And, you know, there are times in your life when you can do that at, you know, the beginning of your career, I still think it's good to think about that issue. But I know so many young people also do have, it's a whole new generation who is actually thinking about, you know, giving back and want and seeing the world and figuring out how their lives and careers fit into that in a meaningful way. And um, I do think that's also a great opportunity in science as well. And I do think you can, if you have that hunger and passion, I, I, I think there are also ways to realize that, you know, now, but also looking ahead to a future career in science, I think ways of paying it forward, if you like that phrase, paying it forward, giving back, you know, is also a, a super gratifying, you know, part of a career in science. And I, I think it would be, I think you could, many of the early career scientists on the call, um, I, I think that's an important message to get across to everyone today as well. Thank you. I think that's a, a wonderful message that, you know, people, uh, you know, at all stages of their career uh, can do things which actually um, help the community and actually enrich one's own experience of uh, the, the career path that one has uh, taken. So I think with, uh, uh, I've, I'm going to switch now to the questions that have come in uh, through uh, the chat box, as well as questions that were sent in earlier uh, from uh, various participants. Um, I'm going to try and identify the participants, but it's a little difficult on this Excel sheet. So uh, forgive me if I'm not getting the right person's name. Uh, so we have a, a question about the Janelia model of doing scientists, of, of doing science, basically that you have uh, scientists and technologists and tool developers working under one roof and uh, towards very long-term research programs. Uh, and uh, the, the question comes from Anirudh, I think, and it says, how do you, uh, how have you and your predecessors been able to achieve this? Um, could you repeat the question one more time? Sure. It, it was about uh, the Janelia model of doing science oh, yeah. and having all these diverse people, including people who are developing new tools and the fact that it's a long-term research program um, and not things that are uh, expected to necessarily deliver in very short time frames. Yes, well, the Janelia model is, is a really interesting one, which is why I decided to come here. Uh, but, you know, first of all, there are two things. One is that um, unlike universities, uh, there is no tenure here. So people spend, uh, it's more like a European model, like 10 years as a, as a junior group leader or 14 years if people come in as a senior group leader and then they transition. So it is a model built on turnover. It is also very much in the ethos of Genelia to really combine uh, programs and individuals uh, who are focused on tool, tool building. And this could be anything from instrumentation, uh, you know, computational tools, um, reagents, fluorophores, et cetera. Uh, you know, there's a, a a big effort here on tool building. And then there are a whole bunch of other scientists who, you know, work on kind of discovery based science of, of trying to dissect a problem of how living systems work. And I think this, you know, immediate interplay within one institute between tool builders and tool users is a really kind of intriguing and very effective part of the Genelia program. And the other element here is the labs are small. So, uh, junior scientists start off with two individuals. Um, they grow to four. Um, senior group leaders have six. So 
Um, they, the labs here are small, which allows more actually even the PI supposed to be working at the bench or intimately connected with the research themselves, connected with mentorship, all of this. Um, and of course, there are no nice thing is there are no grants here. Uh, no one even can apply for grants. It's all internal funding. So isn't it, it's intended to be like small labs, really focused on the science connection between tool builders and tool users. There's a lot of questions in the chat too, which yes, I was looking at. Yes, there are a few in the chat and many of them have already been asked. So I'm going to pick, a, pick and choose a few. Uh, Satya Narayana wanted to know, how do you criticize your own thoughts as a researcher? Well, boy, that is a very interesting <laughs> question. Um, um, well, you know, I, I think, I think there are two answers to that. Uh, one is that we all have blind spots. I mean, let's just face it. I mean, we, we all do. And, uh, um, and the blind spots may be everything from a certain kind of prejudice we have that we take into how something may work. And, uh, you know, our of course, our goal is to solve how things work, not we don't have the power to dictate how they, how living systems work. So sometimes this, this blind spot of, um, you know, certain mental ways of thinking about living systems that, you know, in your own mind may not be right, you know, need to be, I think, challenged through healthy conversation, let's put it that way, and, and being open-minded. Um, so I think as a scientist, it's very, uh, it's not good to be in a bubble. And so like the kind of healthier environments you can create, which, you know, whether it's at lab meeting or other kinds of settings that allow one to, you know, you know, kind of be exchange different ideas as at least being uh, critical in a healthy way, you know, is good so that, you know, you can think about things in new ways. And of course, just the self-realization that probably whatever model you make is probably not going to be truly right. I think, <laughs> you know, or, you know, every paper you publish is not going to be you know, there may be even elements that are, I'm not saying like false, but, you know, not really the complete view of the problem that you're studying. So I, I think even having some healthy skepticism, I would say, of one's own work is very fundamental to being a scientist. Absolutely. Uh so here's a very different kind of a question. And that is, uh, why is it that research papers have to be in a specific format and have a lot of jargon that make scientific discoveries harder to reach the common man? And there's therefore a reluctance to follow science. What's your take on this aspect? And should there be a change in the way discoveries and research are presented? Well, that's a fascinating question too. Um, well, you know, and well, I, I should say that's why we need also science communicators in general. I think, you know, we're doing this here with India Bioscience, and I think India Bioscience does a great job of communicating research in, in formats that can reach more people. Uh, and I think, you know, we've also tried to do other things like iBiology and many other efforts. I'm trying to actually create, um, a free textbook, which all of you can look at if you'd like. It's, it's called uh, The Explorer's Guide to Biology, explorebiology.org. Um, it's actually a partnership with um, um, uh, an Indian technology company called TNQ. Um, but anyway, going back to the paper, uh, you know, if you read it, scientific papers evolve. So if you read papers from the early 20th century or the mid 20th century, they actually read and look really different than they do now. 
Yes. So it's not exactly that scientific papers have even been exactly the same over time. Early 20th century, they were very conversational, actually. Um, um, you know, before that, you know, scientists wrote books, even like Darwin and so forth. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if scientific papers will evolve into new formats in the future. And I think that's a, a really interesting area of exploration. And, and even the reason why it's, I think, necessary to think that is, you know, of course, we're stuffing more information, you know, like figures with, you know, five figures for whatever, a nature paper, but each one has, you know, 15 panels, and then there are supplemental figures, <laughs> 20 of them, <laughs> and, and they're all being stuffed into like, you know, 3,000, 4,000 words. So, um, you know, papers have, I believe, if you look at papers from 50 years ago and now, they're harder to read, quite frankly, unless you're in the field. So um, anyway, it's a great question, you know, should they evolve, will they evolve? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if there will be some kinds of evolution from what we see. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I think it's a great area of innovation. Yes, it, it used to be uh, that, you know, you were referring, for example, to the fact that uh, cloning a single uh, gene and uh, expressing its protein was a whole thesis. And that's, you know, one sub figure in a supplementary panel uh, now. Uh, and so the, the pace at which discoveries take place and technology is expected to happen uh, also drives, you know, how papers are presented and what is considered sufficient uh, extension of knowledge. Um, so it's not even, well, it's not even a figure anymore. You order it, exactly. you order it. And Just it, buy it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, Swati Lekha had a question in the life science, in the lifetime of a scientist, they keep on asking question and spend time to find its answers. My question is, do, does a scientist ever get satisfied with their findings? I personally feel they always have the urge to explore, but how, how have you dealt with the changing circumstances of? Uh... Well, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, it is like, you know, Russian nested dolls, right? You open one, you know, there's always one underneath um, or an onion, you just kind of keep peeling the layers and you find more, but, um, I mean, that's part of the fun of it, you know, uh, um, is, you know, I, I think a good scientific study opens up more questions that it answers. I mean, that's almost the definition of a great study. Um, so if, if that happens to you, you should feel really fortunate. Um, uh, you know, and then of course, there are some times where the questions just get harder to answer. And then you may, you know, I, I mentioned being at the real interface of the known and the unknown, and you have to be able to create a bridge for that uh, in a practical way. Um, and, uh, you know, in some cases that's hard and, you know, next question may be very difficult. So you either have to figure out whether to persist with it or, you know, change to another question. Um, you know, the other thing I should just say is that I love this constant unpeeling of the onion and unfolding new questions after the other. Um, it's not right for everyone. You know, there are a lot of really super talented scientists um, that, you know, I just have enormous respect for that don't want to spend 10 years working on how kinesin works or how whatever, so how a stem cell, you know, differentiates, um, you know, they're very motivated to take their scientific skills and do other things, you know, like have practical applications and make something that could contribute to a drug that's going to help another person or take that skill of understanding the scientific process and do science communication. So there are lots of different ways. First of all, I, I've talked about to be a scientist and to use your scientific uh, skills. So I think that's also important to emphasize. 
Indeed, many people are very satisfied with uh, continuing to ask questions about opening and exploring newer and newer areas, but others would feel more satisfied about taking that knowledge and applying it to something that has a concrete uh, application or translation. And I think uh, it's just a, a question of personality and uh, what drives, there's, there's no prescription that one can give to that. Um, I have a question here from a PhD scholar, Deepika Pandey, and this is a little different. Uh, she, it's a bit more personal. She wants to know, what are your suggestions to maintaining your mental health during the journey of a PhD? <laughs> because as we all know, it can be stressful and competitive and, and full of the unknown. Well, I think this is... Uh, um... I think Deepika asks a very, very important question. And um, I think something that really deserves serious attention also at the institutional level right now, it's pretty clear. I, I mean, at least I, I know in the United States and I would not be surprised in India and many other countries as well, that you know, mental health uh, um, is an increasing problem in trainees both at the PhD level and at the um, um, you know, postdoctoral level. Uh, I, I, I think, first of all, I think this is something that institutions and training programs, and, and also I should say this has increased, this was happening before the pandemic, but it is likely happening and more of a concern now over the last uh, two years where a lot of the social interactions that accompany training also have been diminished. So, um, you know, I'm not sure I have a perfect answer to this. I, I would put this as a call if people are listening to this from institutions in India that I think this is an important issue to pay attention to in terms of providing adequate support for trainees right now. Um, I, I think, uh, and for trainees, I think it's something that people should be aware that uh, probably you are not alone. I think this is uh, not an uncommon um, issue right now. Um, I, I think, you know, in terms of um, what can you do? I, well, I, I, think there, uh, I think there are a few things. Um, you know, one is, well, I just, I want to say this is to get help if needed. I mean, that is the most important thing. And, you know, counseling services are, can be enormously valuable. Um, and, um, and I would just say not a stigma and a very healthy thing to do. Um, I think, um, you know, potentially addressing stress or a stressful situation openly, if you can have that conversation with your uh, PI, again, a very good thing to do. And, and also just figuring out in your own life, like how to create time for yourself, because I think, you know, th there is this possibility that science just becomes this, you know, giant time sink for everyone and people's personal time when they start thinking about what they need to get their paper done, all the personal things that they need to do to pay attention that are super important to do for mental health can fall by the wayside. And I, um, I, I think it's, you know, what, what I think is really important for success and productivity is not just working more hours. And there are plenty of examples where that is not necessarily a path to being successful in science. So I, I think, you know, reserving enough time that you do have the free time to do the things that you like, whether it's, you know, just going for a walk or doing yoga or cooking a meal or getting together with friends. Um, this is a, a, a very important thing for everyone including me, I need, I need to listen to my own words, um, to take ownership of, right, as, um, as, as, as a priority. So anyway, those are, those are some uh, 
some thoughts uh, for you, uh, Deepika. It's an incredibly important issue. And I think people need to take the time to address it both as individuals, as a community. Institutes need to ensure that they focus a little bit about making, uh, you know, while retaining uh, the stringency and robustness of a program, they need to also take care of the people who are participating in it. Uh, so many people in the chat box have been asking about overcoming obstacles as an early career researcher, not getting overwhelmed, not quitting. Did you face this? Did you have to work through this or address this? And um, how have you addressed this as a mentor uh, when people have had uh, troubles either with their motivation or found insurmountable obstacles, what they thought were insurmountable? Yes, uh, well, I'll try to make a brief answer. Um, I mean, first of all, I think, and I don't know why, but probably my most successful trait as a scientist is not necessarily being whatever, smart or things like that, but um, I, I've i always had pretty good resilience and persistence in science. And I, you know, I, I don't think even looking back, it was strategic or whatever. It's just like, it was part of my personality. And I think that was very important. Um, but I do think that learning to expect that obstacle, first of all, obstacles are part of science. They are part of science. And it's important to not take this personally. Um, meaning associating like the presence of obstacles with some kind of personal failure or because that is the nature of science. We do not understand like how life works we have to do experiments. Many of those experiments are wrong. They're incorrect. They don't get us to the target. Um, that is the pact that one makes in this relationship of being a scientist and trying to solve how nature works. So, um, but I think it becomes very personal to people and, um, and worrisome, you know, that they're not making enough progress or things are very, very slow. And, and this is true for many graduate students. And I think sometimes there's this realization, it may happen at year four or five, that, wow, something happened and all these obstacles, I've had all these obstacles and now I actually <laughs> made this breakthrough to get somewhere in my project. And it's almost impossible to explain that from someone who's had that experience to someone that hasn't, uh, to really embody that as a feeling or an intuition. But that is the journey of graduate school. And once you've had that experience, you do much better with your next obstacles that you face, which will happen in science. And the one other thing to say is, I'll be brief on this, but I think the way we train students is does not prepare them well for being a scientist. Now, what I mean by that is when they go to high school or college, they do well in school often, you know, they get grades, um, they get positive feedback every, you know, couple months on some exam. And, um, or for many people, I mean, some people struggle with that, but, you know, science doesn't work well like that. You know, it, it's not a game. Um, it is real life. It, it's uh, not about regular feedback. And there are times that are, are tough. And then there are other times that are very nonlinear where your pro, you know, progress can be very rapid. And I think understanding that is the big transition from undergraduate to graduate school, honestly. Not just in India, I see this all the time in the US too. And um, I think we don't explain that necessarily very well to graduate students, <laughs> that this is part of actually what you're learning. It's not just learning new techniques or things like that. You know, um, you know you're, you're under an apprenticeship of almost a mental prep apprenticeship too, of kind of the skills that are required you know, to be a practicing scientist. So Ron, at the risk of trivializing, you sounded like Master Shifu from Kung Fu Panda about the removal of obstacles. <laughs> 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 
So <laughs> that's, that's the, I used to have a, I used to have a picture of Ganesh by my, by my <laughs> desk. Can you see us? The so, remover of obstacles. Absolutely. Yeah. I, that's the other thing. Always carry, you know, a little Ganesh with you in the yeah. lab. That's my other advice. So Ron, uh, it's been an incredible experience having this chat with you. And uh, on behalf of Ignite Life Sciences and our audience, I thank you for spending this time and wish you more success in the coming years. As director of Janelia, you have a key role to play in cutting edge science, as well as a role model in community development. And we all wish you the very best and hope to see you back in India soon. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Joseph. It was really fun talking to you and look forward to seeing you in person. Uh, I actually can't say as a preview, I will be coming to India in January and I'm giving three lectures with the TNQ Distinguished Lecture Series in Bangalore and um, uh, Mumbai and Kolkata. The rest of my schedule though is full, but anyway, I will be visiting those three, three cities in uh, January. We look forward to seeing you, Ron. All the very best. All right. Thanks. Goodbye. Uh, bye, everyone. everyone. Thank and you. thanks for the invitation. Um, thanks to India Biosciences, Shantala and Suchi and Cactus Communications, Smita and the whole Ignite team for uh, putting this together. Good night. Thank you so much, Jyotsna and Ron. It was a real pleasure to listen to this conversation. I can't even believe that an hour and 15 minutes has flown by. Um, thank you to all of you who joined and for the many, many questions that you submitted. Before we sign off, just a quick note on the slide about the next session that's going to be happening in June. This will be a conversation between Vishwa Dixit and Ramaswamy S. So the link for registering for this will be shared to everybody who registered for this event as well. So with that, again, a big thank you to everyone, Jyotsna, Ron, Smita, Swami, and the IBS team and all of the audience and uh, goodbye.